Hello, everyone. Welcome to Unity of Walnut Creek service here in our living room. I'm Kristen Powell. And my name is Brenly Rada. And we're going to start by going over to Lisa and Tyler's to sing along with this new twist to an old favorite. Enjoy. Tyler, Lisa. Hi, everybody. So um, you're at home, we're at home, but it's Palm Sunday, which is reminding us that we can still be walking forward to a higher level, new perspective. So we ain't going to let nobody turn us around. Sing along. fun. Thank you, Lisa and Tyler. And also, I imagine some of you are enjoying the rain. We sure are enjoying the rain mm. today. You might even be able to hear it in the background of uh, this live stream. So um, settle in, get cozy. Hope you really enjoy our service. We've got a lot in store for you today. Yeah. <clears throat> so unity is a positive path for spiritual living. Our vision for the world is we envision a spiritually awakened world where all life thrives in conscious oneness. Our mission is who we've come here to be. Let's say this together. We are a loving, inclusive community, expanding and living our divinity in sacred service for all. And our core values are love, connection, service, and wisdom. And if you're with us for the first time today, welcome. You're invited to fill out a connection card. Connection cards are available for everyone on the Watch Live page. You may submit a prayer request and our prayer team will pray with you throughout the week. You may also share feedback or request information. Kristen? So the following offerings we have, uh, as, as you know, each week we're adding um, more things to our Zoom experience and we want to encourage you to go on and uh, check it out. If you have a little shyness around technology, just know if you experience difficulty this week, there's a change in Zoom itself. So there's some um, passwords required now and we'll just breathe through that and know that we're all going to get on and get the information out as soon as we can. So I did want to let you know that this Thursday we have a community gathering with our board of trustees. That's at seven o'clock and that's an opportunity for you to get updated on what we're doing as a community and an organization in this strange and transitional time and also what's going on with our finances and our plans around that. So tune in at seven on Thursday to learn more uh, from your board. And we have three brand new offerings starting this week. The first is Person-Centered Expressive Arts with Laura Mallory. Starts uh, this week and it will be on 
Tuesdays and Thursdays at 5 p.m. This is a self-directed creative healing practice. Laura will hold space, offer suggestions, and lead gentle movement to encourage creativity. Please have paper, colors, pens, and art materials of your choice on hand. Mm, that sounds fun. Yeah, sounds great. Would you like to unleash your body's self-healing abilities, balance your emotions, quiet your mind, and open your heart to the presence of unconditional love? Yes, please. <laughs> Shin Zen meditation is uh, done in motion and stillness while seated. So this will be led by Allison Tucker. This embodied spiritual practice class is Tuesdays from 10 to 11 a.m. What does it mean to have connection? It means having a safe and warm place to be in the company of people who care about you and that you care about, a place where you can bring forth your concerns, share and gain insights, somewhere to learn new techniques for self-care, so please join us for the first Unity Connection Corner this Friday at 7 p.m. Please note, after this week, this meeting will move to Thursdays at 7 p.m. But this Friday, 7 p.m., tune in and get connected. To access the links and meeting ID numbers for these and all of our current offerings, visit unityofwalnutcreek.org and just click on the events link in the middle of the homepage. And following this service, we invite you to log on to Zoom for our virtual patio conversation. All are welcome to join us in this. It'll be, we'll start about 1245. <clears throat> and again, if you're having trouble with that password issue, just keep tuning into the website homepage. And as soon as we have that available, it will be posted. And if you're not receiving our weekly e-news, use the connection card link on the Watch Live page to sign up and stay informed. All right, so let's prepare for our statement of faith. And uh, for a time of meditation, I invite you to join, join, join me in affirming our statement of faith. So together, let's take a deep breath. Settling into our hearts. And I invite you to take one more deep breath. Please join me. There is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, the all loving goodness of God. This is a reading by Lynn Unger and it's written exactly for our time. It's called Pandemic. What have you thought of it as the Jews consider the Sabbath the most sacred of times. Cease from travel. Give up just for now. Ceasing from buying and selling. Give up just for now on trying to make the world different than it is. Sing, pray. Touch only those to whom you commit your life. Center down. And when your body has become still, Reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. You could hardly deny it now. Know that our lives are in one another's hands. Surely that has come clear. Do not reach out your hands, reach out your heart. Reach out your words. Reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly where we cannot touch. Promise this world your love, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, so long as we shall live. Mm. And so I invite you now to just enjoy some music by Omni, Ami Taban. This is a chant. Good morning, everyone. The chant for meditation today is the Gayatri Mantra. I'll read a, a sentence about it. 
The Gayatri is dedicated to the aspect of the sun just before sunrise, and it's said that the potential energy emanating from the entire cosmos is contained with the Gayatri. It's also one of the most popular Vedic Hindu chants. I think it's one of the most powerful. It's, uh, it's one I've always enjoyed. So we'll use this one to take us into meditation today. And so we take this beautiful chant, these words deep into our hearts. Allowing the rain to gently fall upon us and within us. Soaking in this moment, this resonance of music that we have just received. Everything is nourished now. Everything settled deeply into the heart of hearts, the one heart. We too now enfolded in that presence, the warm and cozy blanket. As the rain absorbs into the earth, creating a grassy blanket for the earth. Let's be still now, still as the soil beneath that grassy blanket. Still as the soul within us that is infused with peace. Resting completely in this moment, there is no space for worry or concern. No room for anxiety or fear. There's no sensationalized news here, just resting here in this. And allowing the rain to wash away anything that needs to go so that we may experience the life inside of us, the divine truth in us. And so let us go now for a few moments of rest together, 
in a silent space with the pitter-patter of nourishing rain all around and echoing within in the silence. And so slowly now, we emerge from this bed of nourishment. Having been cleansed in our quiet time together, leaving behind what we no longer need refreshed and renewed and perhaps on this rainy day still moving slowly mindfully you might want to wiggle your toes or your fingers or flutter your eyes as you come back into this space allowing the music to carry you into the present Continue in the presence, fully grounded in the now. And so it is. <laughs> Thank you. 
so that was really beautiful. Nice to meditate with you, even in this way. So Lent, you might remember, we're still in that season of Lent, and you might remember that this is a time of fasting, of stripping away, very much like we were doing during that meditation, allowing the purifying rain to just wash away whatever isn't needed. So it's also the time of year that we're in and the time that we are in as a society. Uh, Will McGarvey, who's our uh, local interfaith council executive director, said to me this week, it's the lentiest Lent ever, which really made me laugh. And I, I can't tell if you're laughing, but it's kind of a nerdy minister joke anyway, so. <laughs> so in Hebrew numerology, uh, 40 means as long as it takes. And Lent is calculated, you know, how Easter moves around so much. It has something to do with the full moon. And then there's a 40-day period plus Sundays before Easter occurs. So if you think about that, 40 is just symbolic. It just means as long as it takes, as long as it takes us to get to the resurrection, as long as it takes for us to be out in the wilderness like Jesus and, and so many of the others who spent 40 days, Mohammed had a 40-day period. Th those 40-day periods are these markers of, of just, you know, we'll just be with it as long as it takes. And so... I think that's really timely for us to remember that we are in a season, a liturgical season that's been marked for, for many, many years by this idea of whatever it takes. So anyway, today is Palm Sunday, so it's the Sunday before Easter. And it's this day that is the image of Palm Sunday is Jesus coming into Jerusalem, which is also symbolic of the returning to the spiritual center. So as he rides in to and toward the spiritual center, the people greet him. He's riding on a donkey, which symbolizes humility or humbleness. And, and the people are greeting him as if he is a king, right? They're putting out clothing like a red carpet for him to ride upon. And they're waving palm fronds and they're yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna. And Hosanna means save now. So they're, they're wanting to be, say, that might be your prayer now. <laughs> you know, you might find yourself shouting a little bit of a Hosanna, you know, this sense of, of save, save ourselves in, in, on many, many different levels, right? Save our society, save ourselves in quite a literal uh, term in, during this pandemic time, but also that deeper spiritual understanding that we have of saving ourselves. And we're going to explore that a little bit more today. So this is the Judeo-Christian week that is sometimes called Holy Week. On Wednesday, it's marked by the Jewish holiday of Passover. And that holiday is when the Jews were enslaved by the Egyptians. They had, remember all those plagues that came? You might know about this story or may have it in the recesses of your mind. But there were all these plagues that came upon Egypt. And Egypt at that time was enslaving the Jews. And so when the 10th plague came along, the Pharaoh was like, okay, already, I give up. <laughs> and he freed the Jews. And that plague was the plague where the firstborn Egyptians were dying. And so it, it passed over the Hebrews. So literally it passed over death the angel of death passed over them, spared them. And so at that point, the Pharaoh said, okay, I'm letting these people go. <laughs> and so uh, the Jews were freed then at that time. And so it, a Christian, for the Christian tradition, it's this week of Jesus's trials and tribulations that have, of course, all this deep metaphysical meaning for us on the spiritual path. So for Jesus, it's this, and his disciples, it's a time of goodbye, right? Jesus knows he's going to die. He knows that this is a part of the experience that is about to happen. We don't always get to foresee that ourselves. Sometimes we do. Um, in fact, Myrtle Fillmore, our co-founder, felt that. She felt that it was time for her that she could do her work more effectively on the other side. And so she actually went around the village telling people she was perfectly healthy at that point. And two weeks later, she made her transition. So sometimes we do have a knowing, and, and in this case, Jesus had a knowing. But during that week, so much happened, and it ended up being this week of goodbyes, this week of ritual, this week of honoring life, 
and respecting death, essentially, knowing that um, something was happening here that was really potent. Now remember, Jesus only had three years really with his disciples, and but it was a it was an intense time of three years, right? There was a lot of closeness and a lot of miracles and a lot of working together. And so, this week is marked by their time at, of communion when um, they shared the bread and the wine together, and some final goodbyes and this beautiful time of ritual. Their time in the Garden of Gethsemane together, which was less beautiful for them as a togetherness time, but it's still a big part of this this whole week's happenings. So, you know, before we uh, go to the the topic at hand, you know, we're going to, you know, before we go to Easter, which is the ending point of this week, because a lot of times what happens is we go from Palm Sunday to Easter and we sort of skip all this that happened in between, right? So there is a crucifixion that happens, you know, and that's the part that we don't really like to look at as much, but that is actually the power, the potency of the life that comes after. Easter isn't just about celebration because the celebration doesn't have depth to it if we don't understand that something has ended, that something has died, that something has literally been crossed out. And so what is that something? We're gonna explore that a little bit today and we're gonna look right square in the crosshairs of that experience, if you will, of, of the crucifixion and what it represents of death. I just went ahead and said it, didn't I? Death. I hope you haven't now logged off because <laughs> this is a topic we don't like to talk about. It's a topic we tend to wriggle around when people start to bring up talking about your trust or your will or what's gonna happen at your memorial service. It's just something that gets people really uncomfortable. And so my hope is in this short time together today that we might get at least a little bit more comfortable with the topic. It's a natural part of life. So let's look at right square in the eyes. Let's really take it in and see what is this thing we call death. It's certainly something that if you're tuning to the news, you're hearing about all the time and maybe fearing because it is often something we fear. So what, ha what do you fear? Because that's really a good place to start. You know, when we know some of the things we fear, when we can identify some of the fears that we have, if you follow that line of thinking and you ask yourself, why do I fear that? And you'll say, well, because I fear this. And why do you fear that? Because I fear this. Nine times, maybe 10 times out of 10, the final fear will be because I'm afraid to die. So in real simple terms, if we said, well, I'm afraid to fly on an airplane, why? Well, because I don't want to die, right? That leads right to it. Or I'm afraid to drive on the highway because I'm afraid I'll get into an accident. Well, then what are you afraid of what will happen there? Well, I might get hurt or I might hurt somebody and then might, what might happen? Well, then I might have to go to the hospital and then, yeah, you see where I'm going here. It usually ends up with that ultimate fear that we have of death. And what do we really fear? The unknown, right? The unknown of death, the idea of the, the coldness of death, the darkness of death, the emptiness of death. It's a good time for us to really be looking at it, to really be embracing the idea of this rhythm that is a part of life. Life or nature doesn't, you know, avoid death. Nature shows us over and over again the cycles of life and death and life and death and life and death. So it is a natural rhythm, it is a natural part of our lives. And I think it really behooves us in these times to make friends with it in a way, to at least come to respect it. So in our society, it's actually not just physical death, of course, that we fear. In fact, maybe even more so, or just as much, we fear the death of the ego. The ego is what really clings, right? The ego is what doesn't want to be annihilated or faded away in any way. And so when we look at the, the fear of the ego, you know, it, it, what it brings up is that second fear, that, that second greatest fear that statisticians tell us that people fear. So it's death is number one. And right behind it is public speaking. 
public speaking to a camera. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but really, what is it? What is it about public speaking then that we fear? Well, it's being embarrassed. It's making a mistake. It's you know um, not being effective, not getting our message across, not being understood, not being heard. All of those things are part of the ego, right? So the ego fears all of those things because it doesn't want any chips in its armor. The ego is all about protecting itself and, and puffing itself up or d sometimes diminishing itself. But it's all a game that the ego plays of, of just trying to make sure that everything looks like it's together. And so when there's these little chips in that armor, that's the thing that, th that the ego really fears. And so we'll keep trying to put up a shield of resistance. You can't fear death, right? So you can't be with death. So I was just thinking about this time in, um, in Peru in 2003. I took a group there and it included some people that I knew, some friends, my sister, and some people that were new to me. So it was a, it was a nice group of us um, that were really following, mostly going with ceremonies uh, with a, a shaman named Jorge Luis Delgado. And Jorge led us to Machu Picchu, and instead of going right to the main places of Machu Picchu, he actually took us around the back of one of the mountains, and it overlooked a canyon. And there, we one at a time, he held our legs, and we arched ourselves over a rock into the canyon with our arms stretched out. You're seeing probably a slide in front of you. It's actually not me, that's Vicky, who was one of our participants. But I want to tell you about the experience I had when it was my turn to do this. So, so when it was my turn to arch over that rock and put my arms out, there's this wide, vast canyon there. So it's like you're flying upside down, essentially. And this is part of what he wanted our, us to experience and, and, and an opportunity for us to release our fears into that space. Well, my sister was standing right next to me and my sister is really afraid of death. Her name is Kay. And so Kay says to me, I don't think you're afraid of anything. And I was like, oh yes, I am. So here's the difference between that bodily death fear and that ego death fear, right? And so as I'm furling myself, hurling myself, not hurling, <laughs> unfurling <laughs> myself into that pose, I yell into this canyon where just incidentally, there's a circle of buzzards flying just to sort of, you know, <laughs> heighten the experience of this death. And I say, I fear intimacy and I just yell it into the canyon and there's everybody witnessing me in this right and it was just it was one of those moments where that chip in the armor of the ego fell away so what did I really mean I meant well when I get close to somebody then I was afraid you know falling in love of that the identity my own identity would vanish somehow in that in that melding with another. So, you know, I, I, I like to think I've come a long way and so my ego needs to tell you this so that you're not thinking, well, my minister fears intimacy. <laughs> so this is what we do, right? We're constantly saving our ego. We're constantly from our ego trying to puff it back up or, you know, find a way to, to, to keep the armor up. But when we just let ourselves go, when we just unfurl those fears out into the valley of death, if you will, with especially with loving witnesses, it just dissipates. We let it go. We let it wash away in the rain. And what happens then is we are freer. We are more alive than ever. Facing death allows us to become more alive. And putting out in front of 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 others, those little chips in our armor of ego allows the truth, the divinity, the power within us to come forth in a new way. So, so that's, I think, what happened for me then, you know, just putting it out there in that space. It's like when Brene Brown talks about shame, because that's really a big one, a big part of the ego that keeps things sort of under armor, if you will. And she says, shame cannot live in the presence of empathy. So if you have empathetic witnesses and you speak out your fears, they're going to dissolve even faster. So this is one of the ways that we work with um, this, this fear of death, especially around the ego. 
thinking about back to the story of the Hebrews, you know, so they're they're freed now from the Egyptians and they're out in the in the desert now wandering. Guess guess for how long? 40 years, right? As long as it takes. They're going to wander in the desert until it's time for them to find a new land. And so during that time, lots of things happen. It's a really long story. I'm not going to go into that today. But what I do want to tell you about is just zoom ahead, in this case, to the end of that story. Because they get to the gateway to the promised land. Remember that land was going to flow with milk and honey, very sort of Mother Earth kind of image, right? It's going to be this beautiful, rich, abundant land where there is plenty and it's sweet and it's nourishing. And they get there and the Hebrews are not all going to get to go in. So the old generation, we're told, needs to die off. Well, that sounds pretty cruel. <laughs> but what it really is about, again, it's not so much just about that physical, but it's, there's a deeper meaning to it. What it means is the old ways of thinking is metaphysically we know that people represent thought. And so when we're uh, metaphysically interpreting scripture or something else, we can see that when it's talking about the people, it's talking about the collection of thought, and it also can mean feelings. So the, the old ways of thinking needed to die away in order for the new to come forward, in order to enter or cross that threshold into new life. So I'm wondering for you, what needs to die off for you? Are there some old ways of thinking or being that during this time, during even on this very rainy day, that you might tap into something that wants to wash away, that wants to be given over, that is ready to die off so that you may have life at its highest and best? So I want to invite you just into a moment of silence together, just to reflect on that question. It should be in front of you on the screen. What in me needs to die off in order for my highest good to come forth? You might even want to close your eyes, and it'll just give you a moment to be with that question, to reflect upon it. So I encourage you to go with whatever comes, to trust that what comes is directly from spirit. And also if you need a little more time with this throughout the week, to maybe journal on it or reflect on it, take that question into a deeper space within you. What in me needs to die off in order that my highest good might come forth? So, you know, during this time, there are some interesting things that are being shared and posted and really thoughtful, creative people um, coming forth with some ways to help us through these times. And also some interesting things I've been reading. I hadn't thought about the virus in this way, but I was reading that in some indigenous cultures consider a virus like this to be an ancestor. So if you think about that, it makes sense, right? Ancestors are living things and all life are part of our ancestors, in, especially in indigenous thought. And so if the virus itself is an ancestor, it has come with a purpose. So it comes to us with a teaching. It comes to us for a purpose. It may not be something we wanted to invite in. I know nobody really wants to invite something like this in, but it's here, right? And so. This ancestor has arrived with a teaching, with some wisdom, with something to offer us. And what, you know, I think if it could speak, it might be something like, your way of life is killing you. Stop. 
pause, reflect, think again about how you're doing life, how you're living life. So to give us a little encouragement to this end, my friend Trina Brunk and some of her friends wrote this song for these times. It's called As Together We Rise. Let's listen together. I'm not supposed to touch you now But I want to give it a try with these words and with this melody I want to hold you while we cry All the changes in the days ahead Can't help but shake us all I hope that we can rise in time To face this wake-up call there's a gift in all this mess then let it be fully claimed the way we used to live before was all we'll do for a change I can't pretend to understand the meaning of it all Seen it happen time and again That rise after the fall So my prayer for a soul Is that we rise after the fall But in a way that is wiser And more loving than before And that the things we learn We get to keep And that we love each other more Let this be enough To make the change That we couldn't make before Well, the birds are singing Outside my door, and the earth is quieter than before. And I feel that there might be a little bit of hope in here somewhere. And the truth is that I was lonely before, but I'm connecting with myself here more and more. I think that there might be a little bit of hope in here somewhere Somewhere The sound of something inside of me is calling to watch What arises when everything is falling And I feel that there might be a little bit of hope in here somewhere As together we rise I love that song and also love the images and I want to give a shout out to Shari Dyer who put those images together uh, to go along with the song. So, you know, even as we're talking about this topic today of death, there is a sense of rising in that. There can be a sense of rising in that in our willingness to be open to it, to be open to all of life because it's all a part of one, isn't it? So when I was thinking about um, people who have taught me well about death. The first person who comes to mind is my friend Royda Kroos, who um, she made her transition several years ago. And when she did, the whole process was so beautiful and such a teaching for all of us who witnessed that process. So when she became ill, and at times she had to be hospitalized, 
And during that time of hospitalization, she was just really clear about what she needed. And it made every, it put everybody at ease because she spoke the truth of, of what would serve her best. And so sometimes it was, you know, quiet meditation music and one person visiting or some alone time. And at times it was like a raucous party in her hospital room. And it was so fun. Family and friends would all gather and she had them, you know, do this, decorate the whole room. And there were balloons and there was posters and color and there was this great celebration of life. And even the nurses and the doctors and, the, and those people who came in that were serving, that it brought them so much joy. Because who, dying of cancer, <laughs> has parties like that in the hospital? But it, for all of us, it uplifted our spirit. It, it helped us all rise up to the occasion of the depth of what was happening. We were losing our friend. And she was losing us in a way, but not really. You know, it's just that physical process. It's that human part of us, the heart that breaks open in grief. When Reuda's death came closer and she was home, there was all this ritual that went with it that was important to her, and her children really honored it. And so we had a, a special, she had a, a, in her room set up exactly as she wanted it. There was an altar, and there were candles, and there was beautiful music playing. And when she was well enough, she um, gathered together our women's circle, and we all had one last night of laughs and sharing together. And then after that, she was bedridden, and there was a vigil kept 24 hours a day. So always somebody was there reading poetry that she loved or sitting quietly with her or just saying prayers. And so there was just this beautiful process of how do we die gracefully and with dignity and with reverence and authenticity and all of that happened. We knew exactly what she wanted for her memorial service because she planned it to a T and she assigned the parts to everyone exactly as she, she had hoped it would be and that's exactly what we did. So every aspect of that was a teacher for me. Not to shut down to the topic of death, not to be shy about the topic of death. Even after her body died, she wanted it to be kept as many traditions believe you know, still before it was whisked off to the moratorium like we often do in our society. And so they were able to do that, to arrange in a way that her body could be kept for about three days and we would come and visit and be with her and hold vigil in that way um, before she was cremated. So that whole experience was one that really helped me uh, help others in, in um, recognizing death. And, um, and seeing what a gift it can offer us because it is a natural part of life to, to relate to it in that way instead of pushing it away, avoiding it, wriggling away from the topic. So that's why I brought it forth for us today because it's in our news, it's in our everyday lives now. We're probably thinking about death and I'm hoping maybe this will help us not fear it so much, but embrace it a little bit more and honor and, and respect the life that is in it, you know? Because when death calls us, it's, it, 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 I think death calls us to be better at life. Have you ever been to a memorial service, for example, and you walk out of there inspired, even though you might be sad? Because you learned about somebody's life that touched you and makes you want to be a better person, makes you want to live in a different way. It recommits us to life to be in the presence of death, to really embrace it, to allow it, to be with it. And death lives inside life, like life lives inside death, in a similar way to that, the yin-yang symbol really symbolizes that well for us. You know, there's that dot of life inside death, and there's that dot of death inside life. And it's all part of that whole dance. As we talked about a couple weeks ago in Taoism, it's that walking the line, right, of, of humanity and divinity, of life and death, of all these seemingly opposites that are part of one whole. So, you know, for me, this time, this um, day of Hosanna, <laughs> of Palm Sunday, this save now, is sort of something that we could use at any time, right? If we use this, uh, this, this shout out, if you will, this call to prayer, Hosanna, save now. So what am I saving now? It comes back to that presence. Save this moment, right? 
be present in this moment, which is really what all this talk about death and what Reuda had shared is about. It's about being here now, about being with it, not wriggling away or resisting or pushing away, but embracing, allowing. So Hosanna is something that um, is gonna be my new kind of affirmation for this week, and I invite you to work with that too, to save now, to, to be a call back into the presence. So you know we have Grace, our goddaughter, with us this week. She, um, I went and picked her up actually right after services on Sunday last week. And you know, before we brought her, there was all this talk about you know what's going on for her. You know what's going on in children's minds right now with all these changes in life where they can't see their friends and they can't go to school and they have to sit stand six feet apart. And now people are wearing masks. I mean, it could be a pretty scary time. And. We were wondering about all that, and then on top of it, her mom, Alice, is a respiratory therapist, and so she needs to be out in, you know, on the front lines every day, and so Grace was bouncing around to different friends' houses who are working from home. We said, you know, let's have Grace come here, and we can give her a stable place to be for a while. And yet, we were a little bit unsure. How's it gonna be for her to be separated from her mom? How is this process gonna be? So this week, I got my answer. We were sitting together on the couch, and uh, we had our PJs on, and the dogs were with us, and I was sipping some tea. And Grace was looking out the back of the couch, out the front window, and she said, I love it here. And it just made me so happy. And she said, it's just so beautiful. And I said, you mean the view? And she said, yeah, I love the view. And I looked and I looked at the same view I look at every morning with new eyes, but really what I was savoring was that moment when she said, I love it here. Because it really made me happy to know that maybe she felt safe and she felt loved and she felt comfortable being here, which is exactly what we had hoped to provide. And that's what we're really providing for each other right now, right? A place of safety, a place of love and connection we're getting through this together, and together we shall rise, as Trina just sang. So it's a, it's a walk together, and it's a allowing those moments to be savored. You know, this is one of the ways that we can um, be with death and life, is to be present to what's here now. The moment will pass away, as it already has, the one I just told you about. The memory is still with me. Maybe at some point the memory will pass away. But what will remain is the essence of that, the experience of that, the connection, the love, the feeling. So that's what we carry with us. That's the part that stays. That's the, the ongoing life that we carry moment to moment. So when you think about death, one of the other things, besides being present to it, besides honoring it and honoring the passing, is to really confront it, to really look death straight in the eye and confront it. I had that experience a few years ago on the ball court fast in Death Valley. This is a kind of vision quest experience, and it was my second full experience like this, of course, very aptly in Death Valley. So after three days of fasting uh, from food and shelter and company, we were told to come back, and it's a secret ceremony, so I can't tell the details of it, but we were told to come back and there would be a ceremony of death, a, a entering onto the ball court, if you will, which is a, um, a Mayan um, or Aztec um, experience and um, so anyway, so I, so I finished my three days, and I was very weak, as I often feel, after three days of fasting from food, and it, took a, and it was hot, and it took a long time to get to the place in which I was to face death. And so it just all kind of happened spontaneously that I thought about what did I want to bring with me, or what did I want to do when I faced death. And I remembered as I passed through the base camp that in the cooler I still had something and this symbol felt really important to me. And so I stopped and I got this, not this one, <laughs> but I got a hard-boiled egg. 
And I carried it with me onto the ball court, onto this, into this ceremony of death. And it was really a potent experience. Part of it is because I had been fasting. So I was really clean in a way, it, it, it opened up. Um, stripped away, like this whole experience of Lent that we're talking about, emptied out, if you will. So there was nothing there, really, but uh, a sense of um, willingness and allowing. And yet I had this courage I needed to sort of muster to face death, and it all felt very, very real. So there was death in this ceremony, and I could face it any way I wanted. And I stopped, and I looked at it, And I felt this power. And I said to death, I don't fear you. I respect you, but I don't fear you. And then I very slowly and mindfully cracked the egg and peeled it away. And I took a lot of time. And remember, I was really hungry. (laughs) And I took a big bite of that egg in the face of death. And with gusto, but still with a kind of slow mindfulness, I ate that egg in the presence of death. That experience allowed me to truly face that potential fear with a respect for death and to let even that fear fall away. When I left that space and crossed back over from the ceremony into everyday life, that threshold, it's like I had crossed through the threshold of death. And there was a sense of real aliveness that returned to me. And so this symbol of this week that will probably be more embodying uh, next week for Easter is really what's on the other side of that threshold. So, you know, when you think about the image of Palm Sunday of this day, this image of Jesus riding on a donkey into Jerusalem, think about it in this way, because this is really what I experienced in that story, that my ego became a servant to the divine, became a servant to the Christ. And that's what that image is really showing us, that that donkey is like our ego, and it's in its rightful place. It's serving the Christ. It's serving the divine. That's what happens when the ego gets pushed back to its right place. We're not annihilating the ego, but we're letting it fade back to its rightful place so that the truth can come forward. And that's what dies away, is that ego being out in front, the ego trying supposedly to protect us, but actually shielding us from life itself by shielding us from death and everything else that we might fear. And so instead we might ride, if you will, triumphantly or move triumphantly through our days now with a knowing that there is this humbleness to our ego that can be a great servant to that Christ. As Paul said, Christ in you is your hope of glory. And it's that hope, that glory for all, that is really here for us now. So Hosanna, save now, is the chant of our time. And I want to encourage you to make this a part of your affirmation this week too. That as we do so, as we shout even, Hosanna, that there is an understanding that we respect death, and in that we savor life. Let's close out together with this affirmation. And may it be with you throughout the week if it speaks to you, something that you might echo for yourself in your times of meditation. Or hey, even go outside for a nice walk and shout it from the mountaintop. Let's say it together with that kind of gusto, that kind of feeling of life, that sense of overcoming, having walked through the threshold of death. Together, Hosanna, Hosanna. I respect death, and I savor this moment of life. God bless you.
Thank you, Kristen. So I definitely will take that into my meditation this week, what needs to die away so that my best um, and highest self can rise up. I like, appreciate that. Thank you. So whether you have a joy or concern on your heart today, our prayer chaplains are available to pray with you, provide prayer support throughout the week during our um, virtual patio conversations after the service. You may contact them by phone and email. Please complete a connection card on the Watch Live page or click on prayer requests at the bottom of the home page. Our prayer team will be praying with you throughout the week. I just want to add something. I'm really excited that our prayer chaplains, um, we just put that in place yesterday, are uh, going to be available to you to be able to pray um, on the virtual call. So just as I mentioned earlier, just bear with us if the password thing isn't isn't working, um, we'll do our best to get that posted to the website so you can get on. And I know three of our prayer chaplains um, that might be on this morning to pray with you. Mm, that sounds great, thanks. Yeah. So now let's open our hearts to the practice of giving. Our spiritual home thrives with your continued generosity. I invite you to prepare your gifts as we align with the universal law of circulation. As we give, we shall receive. In truth, there is no lack or limitation. Abundance is our true nature. In addition to sending checks through regular mail or direct deposit through your bank, there are two ways to give online. You may click the donate button on the Watch Live page or download the Give app from Google Play or the Apple Store. Give is spelled G-Y-V-E. I invite you to uh, repeat our prosperity affirmation uh, together divine love, one with me, blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. I am joy-filled and grateful. So I have a ukulele student who is a great strummer, and I taught him a song some time ago called the Summertime Blues, and sometimes to try to get younger students excited about songs, I'll, I'll throw in a few words um, from try to be a little more current. And uh, at a rehearsal recently, uh, uh, a lesson actually, um, we were playing Summertime Blues and I turned it into Coronavirus Blues and he got really excited about it. He said, send me send me the lyrics to that, that song. <laughs> and there weren't really any lyrics, so I was just kind of goofing off. But um, then after the lesson, I thought, well, okay, I better write out a few things to send him. So um, that turned into the song. Um, certainly this is a very serious situation. Um, but one of the great things about working with young people is they remind me to not get too heavy about everything. So I hope you enjoy this one. Well, in a few weeks I can go outside maybe Until then I'll be on the couch with my ukulele Well, I'll see you in a month, yeah, I'll see you all later I hope you stay safe and got lots of toilet paper Sometimes I wonder what I'm gonna do Just sitting at home with the coronavirus blues, yeah Wash my hands 45 times a day If you're behind me in line Please stay six feet away I've been staring at the screen With so much work to do And nobody knows when the virus will be through Pull out the ukulele Sing a song or two While you're sitting at home with the coronavirus blues, yeah. The social distancing across the world and nation. But you can still be nice in a bad situation. Get your rubbing alcohol. 
Your mask and gloves, but it's a small world, friend, so stay in the love. Take a deep breath, cause we're gonna make it through, just waiting out these coronavirus blues, hey. Yeah, we're all in this together, and we're gonna pull through, just another day with the coronavirus blues. Pull out your ukulele Sing a song or two While you're sitting at home With the coronavirus blues Oh wow, that was really great, Ami So thankful for that levity Of that song at these times we're, we're spending a lot of time laughing, aren't we, and joking around and playing. So we want to bless our offering together and just giving thanks for you, the givers who continue to sustain our community. And um, we're doing our best to uh, work with our situation to offer what, what might uh, fulfill your needs at this time. So please feel free to reach out to our staff and let us know if there's something you're needing, some support you're needing, or particular programming that you would like to either offer or to have. Um, we're really open to your suggestions and would love to hear it. And you can share that too on the community gathering call with the Board of Trustees this Thursday. So enough said, let's bless ourselves, let's bless these gifts, let's give thanks for the abundant good that God continues to give us and all of our gratitude. Together, we give thanks for the ever-increasing constant flow of absolute good in our lives now. And I know that we're all grateful for the frontline workers our healthcare workers, our first responders, our food suppliers, our uh, magnificent IT workers, and all those who are serving to meet our basic needs. So let's bless them. Frontline, Frontline workers, workers, we love you, we bless you, we, we appreciate, appreciate you, you, and, and we, we behold, behold the divine light within you. Well, you might have noticed that this one has joined us. This is Grace, our goddaughter, who I was talking about earlier. And she got to be on some of the Zoom call this morning with the youth ministry and uh, with Michelle leading that. So um, what did you get to experience when you were on the call? Oh, you're going to give her the mic. Oh, 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 hold on. I think I have a mic for you. I do. You want to hold that right up to your mouth. We did a prayer, and I also saw my friends, and it was really fun. Wow, that's awesome. Well, I'm so glad Michelle's offering that, and our families are getting together as well. And we want to um, now bless all of those children and youth, as well as the teachers. So let's do that together. Let's offer our blessing. Children and teachers, we love you, we bless you, we appreciate you, and, and we, we behold, behold the divine within you. So now is our prayer of protection, and I want to invite us to hold all of humanity, all of life in mind as we speak this familiar prayer together. The light of God surrounds us. I am light. The love of God enfolds us. I am love. The power of God protects us. I am power. The presence of God watches over us. I am presence. Wherever we are, God is. I am divine. Around to the end of the service, we have some family selfies and, that you won't want to miss, and we want to encourage you to send in yours. So just a silent wave from your family to ours. Um, and you can do that at office at Unity of Walnut Creek. You can send that anytime this week, um, and we'll get those up as soon as we can. So now it is time for our peace song, so let us sing. To you. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be, with God ever present, family are we. Let 
let us walk with each other in perfect harmony. Let these begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my joyous You are the light and the love and the peace on earth right now. So let your light shine. Have fun and spread joy. Oh, I forgot. Have fun and <laughs> spread joy. <laughs> Have a great week, everyone. A little wellness song for you all. Every little cell in my body is happy Every little cell in my body is well Every little cell in my body is happy Every little cell in my body is well I'm so glad every little cell in my body is happy and well I'm so glad every little cell in my body is happy and well Every little cell in my body is happy Every little cell in my body is well Every little cell in my body is happy Every little cell in my body is well I'm so glad every little cell in my body is happy and well I'm so glad every little cell in my body is happy and well Every little cell in my body is happy Every little cell in my body is well Every little cell in my body is happy Every little cell in my body is well Be well everyone <laughs>